Hello and welcome to Unleashed. I'm your host, Will Bachman, and I'm here today with Umbrex member James Agress, and we are going to talk about market sizing. James, welcome to the show. Thanks, Will. I'm glad to be here. So, James, I know that you have done well over 100 due diligence projects, and each one of those typically will include a market sizing. Just give us a quick kind of snapshot on your background so listeners know where you're coming from with your perspective here on market sizing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm a founder of Second Street Strategy, an independent consulting firm that's focused primarily on private equity commercial due diligence work. I do most of my work in, I would say, software space. Probably half of my work is related to uh, software commercial due diligence. And the other half is a mishmash of, of various topics ranging from industrial to uh, uh, to healthcare. I had a, a few steps along the way to this uh, to, to my current uh, to my current role. I worked at the EY Parthenon. I worked at Hulik and Look at the Investment Bank, and I started my consulting career at uh, McKinsey and Company. But now I I do commercial due diligence for middle market private equity companies, which naturally involves a lot of market sizing, and I'm very excited to talk about this topic. Fantastic. So, first question is a two part question, which is why do we care about market size, and what are the different types of market size? There's terms out there like total addressable market, and versions of that. When people say yeah. market size, I, there can be several different uh, subcategories. Walk us through those, and why why is it important to you know size the market? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think you know the importance of market sizing really varies project to project, and I think trying to understand how important market sizing is to each individual commercial diligence is is, is the first question you know I ask myself anytime I, I start a. a a due diligence project or a market sizing exercise. You need to understand the size of the market to primarily understand the size of opportunity that's available to the business you are you are looking at. Uh, if the market is large, it could represent a large opportunity. If the market is small, the opportunity could be a lot a lot more limited. Um, a lot of times, you want to look at the market to understand the competitive dynamics within that market um, in, in a better in a better way. You want to understand what type of market share, for instance, the target company has. Um, and the only really way to understand that is to understand the size of the company and its competitors and in relation to the overall market. Um, sometimes you really want to understand the growth that's that's possible in a particular market. So what I try to do is understand the current size of the market and then understand its drivers and its growth drivers and project the market uh, to uh, in the future for three to five years uh, to try really try to understand the opportunity again that's available to the target company. So let me ask you this um, and, and help us explain some of the different terminology for market size. So if I am thinking about opening up a barbershop in a town, you could say, what's the market size? Well, you could say, well, the market size for the entire United States barber market is is X millions yeah. or billions of dollars, but I don't care about that because if I'm in the center of Indiana, I'm not going to give someone a haircut in New York. So you would focus probably on just the this number, the market size in your town. Um, so what do you, what are the different terms for market size? Like I think there's to, total addressable market and there's probably some other versions of that. Walk us through the different terms and what they mean. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the terms that you commonly hear in relation to market size are uh, TAM, total addressable market, SAM, serviceable addressable market, and SAM, serviceable obtainable market. And the difference uh, difference in them is is, is, is is quite interesting, I think. You know, to use your analogy, uh, Will, if you're opening a barbershop in town, you want to understand the total addressable market that's available to you. Uh, you know, you can look at the total population of the town and then, you know, the number of times <laughs> somebody gets a haircut in, in a given period of time and then the price of the haircut and kind of multiply everything out and you would get the total addressable market, uh, which for any sizable town could be quite large. Uh, but then the question is, is this market really serviceable to you? You know, not every barbershop serves every type of client. 
Um, some serve only men, some hair salons only serve women, some are expensive, some are not so expensive. Uh, so you really want to say what's serviceable to you given the capabilities that you have within the business and, and your target market. Uh, so that's when the segmentation begins. Maybe you are serving, um, you know, providing really expensive, uh, you know, uh, haircuts for men, right? So you really want to understand, okay, what percentage of your town of your town is represented by men in a certain income demographic who are willing to spend a lot of money on the haircut uh, and then the price point is going to be higher and if you kind of multiply that out that adoption this is how you would end up with serviceable adjustable market uh, the SAM um, and then and then there's a the concept of SAM which is the serviceable obtainable market well you're not the only barbershop in town presumably that provides high-end men's haircuts um, how are you able to reach your desired audience? Um, you know, are you able to advertise to the entire town? Is a people from every suburb in your city going to come to you, or are you going to, you know, advertise and try to reach a particular demographic, a particular uh, geography within the town? So you can kind of further divide that out to obtain serviceable, attainable market. Uh, the sum. Okay, great. So I know that you have prepared for us. Uh, several examples and and what I'm looking forward to is you walking us through like different approaches to sizing a market and you know kind of in different yeah. categories so uh, I'll let you just go ahead and lead yeah and you know feel free to jump in with uh, with questions as I kind of go along here and you know I try to organize them and uh, kind of you know from easiest to uh, to hardest uh, so to speak to to analyze so, you know, I think the, the, the most basic uh, market sizing framework or methodology you can have is price times quantity, or quantity times price by kind of segment. So one example I can, I, I can provide here is I looked at the markets for dental practice management software a couple of years back. So, you know, you have, everybody goes to the dentist, presumably, and they run their business on practice management software. And I wanted to understand uh, the size of that market. So this is this is a fairly easy market to size, right? Um, for, for a number of reasons. One is the number of dental practices in the U.S. is a, is a known number. It's 138,000 of them, or at least it was in 2021 when I when I when I did this project. And also their segmentation is fairly known. You understand how many of them are solo practitioners, how many of them have multiple locations, how many are owned by large dental service organizations, and so on. Um, and pretty much all of them have adopted some sort of practice management software. So the adoption rate is close to 100% in all of these segments. Uh, the pricing for uh, software across all these segments is also fairly well known. So it just becomes really easy to multiply quantity times 100% adoption rate uh, times uh, monthly spend with on, on, uh, on practice management software to get to, the, uh, to this market size, which is about half a billion. Okay, I follow that one. Okay, so that's number yeah. one, price times quantity. What's number two? Um, well, so you can get we can get a little bit uh, hard example, right? And a lot of times I try to use multiple methodologies whenever that's possible to, uh, and hopefully they kind of line up with one another to uh, to really estimate uh, a market size well. So another example, I looked at software that was used to manage reservations at um at state and and, and national and, and, and uh, local parks uh in us and canada so you know if you were to take a camping trip uh you would go and try to book your campsite reservation on a on a portal site for um for the um I apologize for the um uh, you know, for the for the state park, for instance, and uh, the state park would uh, provide pay a, a share of uh, of the reservation cost uh, to the software provider, right? So what I was trying to understand is essentially the size of the market for these providers. Well, you can use you know the old kind of uh, uh, the P times Q um, methodology that I mentioned earlier. For instance, we know the number of visitors to parks across the U.S. and Canada. We have some data on how many people go to campsite, uh, which we can use to figure out basically the number of visits. Uh, we also know the pricing and kind of the percentage that uh, these vendors typically pay 
uh, the, the state parks typically pay to these vendors to come up with, with one way of doing it. And then another way is, uh, you know, there's only so many of these state parks and the target here, we have their data and they, um, they serve, uh, you know, 20 out of, let's say, um, 80 different parks organizations out there. Um, and I know what their kind of share is of the market and what their percentage charged. And I can use that as a proxy to kind of extend that across the other, uh, the other uh, parks that they do not, uh, they do not serve. Um, so I basically use the, the proxy data that I have to extend it to, um, uh, to a wider, to a wider market size. Okay. So let me, let me check on this one. So this, this one would be, let's call this method number two is if you have a known target company that operates in a market and, yeah. and you know their revenue, you could take a estimate of their market share and say, well, we think we have a 13% market share, or let me make it easier, 20% market share. So then the market is five times your company's revenue, right? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. I think there's a underlying assumption that you need to validate here, which is all the other competitors operate in a similar manner to, to the target here. So you can feel comfortable extending this, you know, this methodology to the, to the rest of the market. And in this case, though, that is, you know, this is how those companies operate. Uh, so this was, this was the second way to kind of size the market here. Okay, great. So we'll call this the, uh, uh, sort of backing, backing into it from your, your own company's market share. Yeah. All yeah. right, cool. Now it's number three. And uh, another methodology is uh, I kind of want to go back to P times Q, but there's a key question of adoption rate that wasn't present in the dental example. Um, and that's often the, the, the kind of the hardest thing to get, right? So the example I want to I want to bring up is I looked at the market for um, for waffle service. So, you know, if anybody stays at a, at a hotel traveling for business, I'm sure they've seen uh, waffle irons at, 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 at hotels. Uh, those are actually provided by um, a handful of, not even a handful, a couple of vendors um, that, that provide a whole service, waffle iron mix and everything else associated with it. And they serve hotels as well as restaurants. And I was looking to understand the market size for, uh, for something like this. Well, on, a, on the surface, it's kind of easy, right? Because you know how many hotels are there across the U.S. and you can make some estimates in terms of, you know, what type of hotels by uh, price point, for example, serve waffles and don't serve waffles. Um, you know the number of restaurants um, in the U.S. There's 680,000 restaurants in the U.S. That's, that's known from the National Restaurant Association. Uh, and you also know the pricing uh, for, for waffle service um, or the annual spend, rather, hotels and restaurants have with, with these vendors. Well, it's really hard to understand, particularly for restaurants, is what percentage of them are going to serve waffles, right? Uh, and and that's kind of and that's kind of the crux of, of the of of the matter here, right? So the idea is that I needed to understand different ways to estimate what percentage of restaurants serve waffles. So I looked at things like industry interviews, right? So talking to a number of number of um, folks who participate in the industry, for instance, in the, in the waffle industry, right, to try to get a sense of how uh, how they see this market, what percentage of, of the of the restaurants buy waffles. Uh, there's uh, data you can get on menus, uh, and you can you know, do some analysis on that data to uh, basically understand how many times the word waffle appears on menus, excluding things like waffle fries or waffle cones and things like that. <laughs> uh, to try, to try, right. Yeah, that, that is, that, 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 that's an important component that, as I learned, because that, that does overestimate the, the actual, uh, <laughs> the actual amount of waffles that are being sold out there. So getting that adoption rate, which is about 10%, uh, is, is kind of the key, uh, the, the key to getting, uh, to getting the market size, sizing right here. When you have the price and the quantity, the overall quantity is kind of known. The adoption rate is often the, the hardest, uh, the hardest variable to get here. If you were doing this outside in and you were not, say, doing due diligence on a particular target, how would you go about getting the pricing of 
the this waffle service. And and by the way, that's news to me. I I'm so surprised. I thought the hotel would just buy a waffle iron and make their own batter. Uh, this is news. But ah uh, yeah, <laughs> something I've definitely learned. Yeah, it was, it was news to me as well. A lot of times, because I imagine these waffle companies, you know, say call us for a quote, right? They probably just don't have a price on their website. Oh, it's you know, $159 yeah. a month for your hotel for the service. So how would you go about getting that that pricing? Yeah, that's a great question, Will, because I think particularly in the due diligence context, and for those listeners who don't know, due diligence tends to be a very kind of sprint-like project, typically three weeks in duration, um, where you have to gather a lot of data, uh, planning ahead and figuring out how you're going to get some of those critical assumptions is is extremely important. Because the last thing you can afford to do is, you know, and, and wait till week three and then figure out you need to do a broad survey of the market or you need to talk to, you know, 20 different people in order to, to, to get some of those assumptions. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's several ways to get the pricing if it's not available to you. One, and probably the, the one I use most common is talking to people. I talk to restaurants, I talk to hotels, and I understand how much money they spend on waffle service. Um, and if the numbers are fairly consistent or I can standardize them to the size of the restaurant or size of the hotel um, or a particular segment, um, that's, that's a great data point to use in market size. Talking to competitors or market participants is another way of doing that. People are often you know, willing to share general pricing information that, uh, that, that's not necessarily that sensitive. Uh, to be able to uh, to then incorporate those inputs into the market sizing equation as well. Fantastic. So, so that's, I mean, any market sizing eventually is going to be based, be in generally be based on you know price times quantity. So that's some different ways of getting at the price piece of it. Um, in these cases that you've given so far, some of the quantity was fairly well identified. You can look up how many dentists there are. Yeah. But um, how do you go about getting the quantity side of things when you know it's not a known industry or an industry with sharp data like the number of restaurants, but something more like you know? I mean, I'm sure you've worked on industries where getting in the quantity itself required yeah. a lot of digging. Yeah, absolutely. So the, if if the, the key to being able to do price times quantity is just a little bit of availability of good quantity data. And a lot of industries have good quantity data, or at least proxy data you can use for quantities. Um, you know, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, you can, for instance, get the number of plumbers and the number of roofers and the number of various other professions that if you're selling to those, into those, uh, you know, to those segments, uh, you are able to, to then uh, figure out the, uh, the quantity side of, of the equation. Uh, but a lot of times, like you said, that is that is not available and different methodologies can be used. I think a, a popular methodology, a common methodology where it's available is kind of a competitive buildup, right? So one uh, example I can give, I looked at a market for next generation 911 software. So if you call 911, uh, there is a call center, obviously, that's, uh, that is staffed 24-7 and it has a software solution that uh, that it operates on, um, and the software solution is quite involved because it has to involve all the, uh, you know, all the telecom providers in the area, and it's a lot of redundancy and emergencies and so forth. They need to be uh, handled uh, extremely well, given given the you know, the importance of of the software. And so, as a result, there's only a handful of companies that are participating in this market, and these contracts tend to be awarded on state by state basis. Uh, with the exception of California, they're kind of split it into into uh, four different zones, uh, and there's only uh, there's only one, two, three, four, five companies that that are really that are really doing this. Uh, some of those companies are public, or they've published their revenue information. Um, some of them, well, one of them is the target, so I know what their revenues are. Um, and then uh, for the rest, you can you can. Um, uh, you can develop estimates through calls. And on top of that, because this is done at a state by state level for the most part, and you know the population of states and the pricing is based on um, on kind of number of lives covered, so to speak, very often, 
you're able to kind of marry those things two together and say, okay, I know that company X, you know, represents 30% of the market and their revenue is you know, 100 million. Um, company Y represents 20% of the market and so on and so on to build the market up this way. Excellent. Fantastic. Okay. Let's go to the next, uh, the next, uh, yeah. sample you have. And another example is, is customer buildup, right? So it's kind of the, the flip side of that. This, this is particularly useful in a situation where there's only a handful of, of, of customers out there. You know, for instance, um, I, I did another diligence looking at uh, mobile device management software that's sold through telecom operators in the U.S. And, you know, in the U.S. there's only three major telecom operators, Verizon, AT&T, and, and T-Mobile. Um, their size is well known. Their number of subscribers is, 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 is well known. Um, so you kind of know what the opportunity is available with each of these individual customers. Um, so you're able to essentially add them up to figure out what, what, what is the size of the market. This is also could be very relevant if you're selling listings for big box stores or home improvement stores. Um, you know, there's Lowe's, Home Depot and Menards, and then we're going to certain that we have a certain market share. Uh, and if you're doing building products, plumbing products that, that have looked in the past, uh, this is a methodology that you can also use to try to build up the market from the customer side. So you're saying if you know how much Home Depot spends on garden hoses, then you could sort of make some estimate, and you know how much Lowe's and Menards does, yeah. then that's going to be a pretty good share of the market, and boom, you're done. That's, that's exactly right. Uh, fantastic. Any other examples? Uh, I, I, I have examples of other methodologies for sure. I think another way to look at it is uh, trying to understand – um, what is the share of the broader market that the market you're looking at represents? So an example, and this is actually a Numbrex project, is I looked at micropiles, which is a deep foundation technique. So if you're thinking of, like if you look at a skyscraper or highway bridge, uh, the way the foundation for some of these structures would look like um, yeah, they would drive these giant metal tubes into the ground and use them as foundation to, to support the rest of the structure. Well, there's no uh, quantity, right, available for something like this um, because there's just so many different construction projects and they vary year to year and so forth. So what you kind of have to do is, or the way I did it is I looked at, uh, at uh, you know, the share of the broader construction market that micropiles represent. So let me give you kind of more details here. So, you know, the U.S. Census, uh, they have an estimate of construction put in place by, of course, various types of buildings. In 2021, when I did this, this was about $800 billion. Um, then uh, 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 there is data out there on understanding what types of buildings are over 100 square, 100,000 square feet. Uh, which typically involve heavy loads, which have a use for this type of uh, foundation technique. Um, then through industry interviews, you can gather numbers on the uh, deep foundation as a percentage of the whole construction costs for these, for these buildings. And I've done a number of interviews to try to get an average number. And everybody was kind of aligned more or less on a, a deep foundation representing 5 to 10% of construction costs of most buildings. Um, and then there's some data from um, EIA that, uh, uh, that uh, talks about the types of deep foundations that vary state by state, region by region, because those, that, that foundational technique is only applicable to uh, certain geologies across the U.S. And essentially then uh, kind of multiplying everything out to figure out what, what the size of the, uh, of the market is uh, for, for micropiles. So you're taking something that's a fairly known market size and then figuring out a percentage of that so you it sounds like you took yeah. the total construction market and then figure out how much of that construction market is for big buildings for skyscrapers and then for skyscrapers mm -hmm. how much of the cost of the skyscraper is the deep foundation and that led you to the answer yeah that's exactly right so it just continues stepping down from a broader uh you know from a broader uh market to a, to a more narrow market that 
that you're looking at. And that, another good example for something like this is I look at um, parts for appliance repair, distribution of parts for appliance repair. So, you know, appliance repair number, uh, size of the industry is a, is a, is a published number. Um, and uh, through interviews and other research, I can estimate what percentage of uh, appliance repair cost is represented by parts. It's about 29%. Uh, so multiplying all of that out, you know what the parts spend uh, for re- appliance parts spend for repairs in the United States. Fantastic. What is your next methodology? Uh, next methodology. Um, let me see. Kind of coming towards the end here. Uh, so another market I looked at is market for. Uh, so we're getting to a very complex, I'll say, markets that just don't have a lot of published data on it. Right. So another market I kind of looked at is is uh, market for fire and security alarms, and this is just you know as you can imagine, uh, you know, fire and security alarms go into pretty much every commercial building, every multifamily residential building. Uh, it's just a very, very broad market um, globally as well. That's just not going to have a lot of foundational data. And the pricing is also going to vary quite a bit from project to project, from building to building. Um, and there's also a lot of different vendors who participate in various aspects of the market, making the competitive build really, really impossible. Um, so what you kind of have to do is you have to rely on published uh, industry sources. So, for instance, we know that uh, from a number of different reports that the uh, global fire and security markets in, uh, is about $110 billion a year. I kind of looked at it. Um, and it's segmented across different regions. And I was interested in particularly North America. So I can take a segment of that in, into what, uh, what North America represents. Um, we can then, from uh, from some other uh, secondary sources, we can kind of split that into fire and life versus security uh, to try to get a sense of okay, what is the fire alarm market is, um, and then and then kind of marry that with a more of a bottom up estimate from the number of different uh, companies, right? So this is uh, you know there's uh, fire and security systems are implemented by integrators and there's a published list of top 100 integrators in, in, uh, in, in the globally in the U.S. looking at their revenues. Um, but that's not a complete list of companies who participate in this. So through industry interviews, you kind of have to true it up to get to, you know, so you know what the revenues of those top 100 companies is because that's a published number. But like I said, it's not a complete list. So you have to true it up to, uh, uh, to basically understand what other companies are not included in the list. So it's a combination of using that, uh, you know, competitive build methodology, um, and then um, and then exclude some companies that don't do fire, just do security contracting, and essentially kind of massage all those numbers together to come up with a, you know about a twenty-five billion dollar estimate for 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 fire alarms and security. And the reason this estimate is, you know, this method is so uh, ambiguous, I guess, and the and the and 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 the, and the precision on it is probably isn't as high as the other numbers is that you know if the market is 25 billion dollars or if it's 15 billion dollars you know i'm looking at a company here that was probably 100 million dollars in revenue it's not really that important at the end of the day right whether the market is 25 billion dollars or 35 or even 50 billion dollars the question for the for the acquirer here is more about the opportunity uh the competitive the competitive dynamics of the market uh, the growth dynamics how easily is it to to displace, for instance, uh, some of these companies? Um, so the market size becomes a less important question in these kind of more ambiguous situations. All right. Now I want to ask you about how have you dealt with situations where it is a nascent or a new or not even yet existing market? Yeah. Like if I had asked you a year ago, um, what's the market size for tools built on chat gpt4 right mm-hmm. You're like well it hasn't been released yet so it's zero right now but um you know a year later today it's, it's you know it's existing and it's growing so how do you um how do you think about that when their market doesn't yet exist because of technological change or innovation yeah yeah that's a great question well 
Um, I think looking at nascent markets, this is one of the examples where market size currently isn't that important. Right? What you really have to understand is market growth dynamic and adoption of these emerging technologies. For example, uh, two years ago, I looked at the market for vocal biomarker software. Uh, so, you know, the theory and the science, not theory, there's, there's the science behind it is that a number of uh, behavioral health conditions and um, uh, as well as like cardiovascular conditions uh, can be not diagnosed, because that's not the right word, but at least uh, markers could be found in people's voices. And particularly during the size, of, uh, just, this was done during uh, uh, peak of COVID, right? So having people uh, call uh, a phone line, right, and produce a sample of their voice, um, and then having an algorithm be able to pick up that there is signs of respiratory distress, right, to so then be able to say, okay, you should probably go test it. That, that became a, it was a very you know, uh, important, I guess, use case for this type of software. But there's other use cases, right? You can pick up the signs of, of depression or cardiovascular di disease. So this is an emerging market, right? This is not a, a practice that's commonly adopted. Um, there's, there's just very, very limited um, uh, current, you know, current utilization of, of these types of technologies. Um, so, you know, how, how do you look at a market like this, right? Well, I think you have to work to understand, you know, what are the actual use cases for technology? Who, who are the, what are the different routes to market? Who are the potential users of this technology, right? So for something like this, uh, there is uh, a biopharma or, or clinical research organizations that are using uh, vocal biomarkers in their, in their clinical studies. Um, there's companies that are interested in, in using this technology for employee health monitoring. So these tend to be, you know, large kind of uh, large employers, employers in the United States. Uh, there's a way to incorporate this technology into consumer devices um, uh, to monitor for, uh, you know, for certain populations where, where appropriate uh, things like smartwatches. Um, there's obviously payers uh, who may or may not be interested in this type of technology and, and as part of their um, uh, you know, service delivery, uh, and then also cl uh, practitioners, clinical practitioners, and you can figure out the number of you know of, of each of these players is. But the big question becomes, what percentage of them can possibly utilize that technology, right? And because you're looking, none of them are really utilizing it now, with the exception of, of, of biopharma. Uh, what you're trying to do is you're trying to establish what percentage of them could eventually adopt something like this. This is done through interviews. This is done through through research. Uh, I, I didn't do a survey for this particular uh, for this particular project, but a survey could, could also be used um, to try to essentially identify, you know, how many instances of this type of software can be can be utilized across these different segments, and then and then work with a target to try to say what what the price could be for these different use cases. They kind of thought about them and, and, and they have a pricing model in mind uh, to try to figure out what the market size could be in in, in a few years for, uh, uh, for these types of technologies. And that's the same, you know, if somebody asked me to size the market for AI tools, I think the, the first question should become, okay, well, AI tools for what use case? Because that essentially what is needed in order for you to you know, build a foundational number from which you can then apply different criteria to build the market size further. Talk to me about how you may or may not work to triangulate the market size by coming at it from you know different approaches, different methodologies that you've discussed to say, you know, do they come up with the same answer or are they off by a factor of something? Well, that's that's a great question. Sometimes sometimes they do, right? And that 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 that's really, uh, you know, that that's that's really uh, exciting, and I guess it makes you feel good about your calculations. And sometimes they don't. But I think in both cases, you have to kind of understand if you if you come up with a market size with two different methodologies and they come up with exactly the same answer, I think the first question I ask myself is, did I use, uh, you know, the same kind of set of assumptions? Um, to to put into the different methodologies in order to produce the same result, right? So then, if the, if the answer to the question is yes, 
then you're not really using kind of two different two different methodologies. You know, you just rely on everything on the, on, on the, on the single adoption. Uh, and when they do not, well, then the, the question becomes more interesting. I think you have to understand, you know, why not, right? If one method is, um, you know, 10 times produces a result that's 10 times larger than the other method, um, you know, that produces a natural question, why, right? Well, maybe your kind of bottom-up method that produced the result that's 10 times smaller just looks at, at the segment of the market uh, that the top-down result, for instance, generated. Then, um, then you have to do some work on your top-down analysis to try to figure out, okay, are you looking at the right segment? Can you cut it down? Um, and, or maybe you miscalculated something, you didn't right, use the right assumptions for your bottom up sizing. Uh, and you really have to adjust it to, uh, to kind of, uh, to help, to help, to help the both markets meet. Ideally, multiple methodologies for the same market should aim to produce the same result. Um, you know, if, when they don't, then the question becomes, you know, where am I wrong in my assumptions? What additional data? do I need to gather in order to remediate that? You ask, you do a lot of interviews. What I are do. some of your favorite questions to ask around pricing? And I'm guessing that sometimes it might not be the best just to ask, okay, what's the price? Maybe you go after it and say something like, oh, what do you think your competitors typically charge? Uh, or maybe have other clever ways to get at it where people feel more comfortable responding. Yeah, I, th I think you have to, uh, you know, when you ask these questions, you, you have to understand the nature of sensitivity to pricing in a particular industry. Um, you know, in the waffle example that I was talking about earlier, uh, pricing is not a secret. Everybody kind of knows what everybody's charging. So you, I could just trade up and ask, you know, what is what is, what is the price here, right? By the way, and, by the way, what is the price for a waffle service? I gotta ask. I think for a restaurant, it was annual spend for hotel annual spend was about three thousand dollars a year, um, if I remember correctly. Um, so that includes, you know, all the batter essential and all the stuff that they're buying. And um, for restaurants, it was a little bit cheaper because they don't uh, they don't necessarily. Uh, buy as many waffles there's lots of other stuff you can get at a restaurant it was about uh, 2.3 2.3 thousand uh, dollars a year my, my kids do like those hotel waffles okay back to the they question sure so, so, <laughs> so so okay so so the sensitivity so some industries yeah. it, may, it's, it may be just relatively transparent so they'll just tell you right they're not it's not like a big yeah. secret and then and then when issues where it's where it's um, more or less transparent rather from the competitor perspective I also do a lot of customer calls um, and I think asking what your annual spend is or what your monthly spend is for a particular service and category uh, can open help you understand what, uh, 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 you know, what the pricing is in a particular industry. Um, I think, you know, for, for, for project on 911 systems that I was talking about earlier, uh, a lot of that information is publicly available given the public nature of, of, uh, of those, um, of those, uh, you know, of, of those projects and solutions. Um, a lot of times looking at online forums is really helpful. I mean, Reddit is, is a great tool for a number. There's a number of subreddits for, uh, particularly for system administrators. And I've looked at a number of uh, kind of system admin tools out there. And they tend to be very vocal about the tools they like, they don't like. Um, and, uh, you know, even how much money is, uh, is being spent. On, on various solutions. Um, some industries are a lot more opaque and pricing is, is difficult to get and you really have to think of different methods to, to size the market. T tell me about one of those, w some industry you worked on where it was really hard to get pricing. Yeah, so like, uh, you know, for instance, I looked at uh, cybersecurity solutions, uh, uh, net firewalls and, and natural firewalls and a couple other solutions. And it's just such a big market with so many different companies, you know, both the large and small and so many different competitors participating in the market at various price points that doing this kind of P times Q is just not really possible. Um, and at the same, 
time, it's, it's not really that important, right? Because the market for these solutions is about $40 billion. And again, I was looking at our companies for about $150 million in revenue, right? So the exact size of the market is, is not as relevant. What became very relevant is, okay, out of that $40 billion, what are the actual segments where the solution is the most applicable to, right? So, you know, if we're talking about software and, and, um, and uh, particularly uh, security software and, and nature, there's a lot of uh, reports from Gartner, for instance, that look at these markets in a lot of detail and they provide, uh, you know, various segmentation on, on the type of software, you know, whether you like Gartner or not, and most a lot of people don't, and whether it's <laughs> pay for play, which it is, um, it still it still makes it uh, uh, you know there's still good data that can be generated from those reports and, and different segmentation, right? So then uh, you know the question on the market sizing become becomes not really okay, what is the size of the total market here, but out of this forty billion dollars, um, you know which what uh, segment of the market do SMBs represent? which is what this this uh, solution provider targeted. And out of that $8 billion that the SMBs represent, okay, what percentage of that is, you know, physical firewalls or identity security software, a couple other kind of different things that, um, that, uh, that this company was really targeting. And, and that became the key question of, 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 of the cases using the Gartner data and trying to really understand, okay, where is the solution most applicable to I wanted to ask you if you make a practice uh, of providing kind of multiple uh, layers of market size to help provide context to your private equity clients. And I'll give an example. Let's say that you were looking at a company that produces organic, freshly made dog food, right? Mm -hmm. So. You could imagine you, you you might communicate to them to put the numbers in context. You could say, "Well, look, this is the entire pet food market in the United States, and then here's the dog food market, and then here's the organic dog food market, and then here is the freshly made organic dog food market." So mm -hmm. you, they could kind of see where that fits in, right? Um, do you do you ever do anything like that, like trying to show the the lay, you know kind of the the not exactly the Venn diagram, but just sort of the uh, expanding, uh, expanding as you expand the definition. Yeah. So I think, I think trying to get to a more precise definition of the market, right. And figure out exactly which segment the, the target is relevant to is, is extremely important. The example I just gave with the cybersecurity solutions is, 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 a, is a perfect example of that. You know, like I said, the cybersecurity solutions market, you know, according to Gartner and a couple other sources, $40 billion. But what segment is really relevant to this particular company? Well, it's SMBs, which is $8 billion out of 40. And then uh, they only provide certain types of solutions um, that, um, that you can figure out what, what the segment, what si what's the size of those individual segments for SMB customers is, and that becomes the market size. Awesome. And it's not, and it's not that they, in theory, cannot participate in that $40 billion market because they provide network security solutions and that's the network security solutions market size. They're just not necessarily as well positioned to uh, support enterprises or provide other types of, uh, or provide solutions for other sub-segments of the market. James, I'm wondering if you may be able to pull out one last example. I'm curious if, if anything comes to mind of sort of the wackiest or the most creative or outlandish or, uh, you know, roundabout way that you have done to come up with a market size where you were proud of yourself. It was, you know, some kind of, some kind of clever that you had to apply to it. Yeah. Besides, besides the waffles, uh, uh, I, I think, you know, whenever asked me that question, that's probably the one I would use. Um, I, I think looking at, um, Anything that has to do with building products and um, and construction, it's it's always kind of interesting to me because there's just not a lot of good data published on. Uh, there's some data published on it, so uh, you know there's EIA data on um, on essentially square footage of commercial buildings by um, by the sector and industry, and trying to build a model essentially to kind of 
marry that. The data doesn't update it, unfortunately, very often. So you can always have to uh, bring it forward a certain number of years based on the construction trends in the U.S. Um, but then trying to kind of marry it with, with different construction projects. Like, for instance, I looked at fire doors. Um, so, uh, you know, these are doors. If you, if you go to a hospital, for instance, and somebody trips a fire alarm, well, the fire doors are going to close automatically to prevent the spread of fire uh, between different parts of the building, right? What's the market size for that? Um, since there's so many different buildings where this can be applicable to and, and you know, how many fire doors are there in the building, right? So um, you kind of had to, you know, use that square footage data that's publicly available, but then try to figure out how many doors are there. Well, how many different types of fire doors are there? Some uh, type of buildings have, like hospitals, like I said, that fire doors between different sections of the building. Uh, some uh, buildings have fire doors that are only at the, you know, egress of the building um, or the entry of the building um, and so on down the line. Some have them on every kind of, if it's a multi-story building, you're going to have a fire door in every uh, 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 entry to the stairwell. So trying to essentially count up all those fire doors and then figure out what the service component of them is because that was that was the key question of the case um and kind of trying to marry that all together it was a very kind of intense data exercise to be able to be able to estimate that that market size james where can listeners find you online if they want to follow up secondstreetstrategy.com or look me up on linkedin james Eggers. and we will include those links in the show notes james this was hugely educational for me thank you so much for joining today Thank you for having me on, Will. Really appreciate it.